So welcome everybody. My name is Brent Griffith. I am with the Broken Token Classic Gaming Podcast is, is showing up here. So I am going to give a little talk. We're going to talk a little bit about collecting arcade games. So let me start out before I kind of get into this. This may start to sound a little negative, as in I'm trying to talk you out of it. And there's a few people in here already that's already kind of giggling because they have had this experience. And that's, that's not my intention here. If you, if you listen to the show, my co-host Whitney Roberts and I, we are very supportive of the hobby and of the community. But we also have to be very realistic because we're not collecting stamps. We're not collecting something that's rather static. This is older equipment, it has a life of its own, and things happen. And you have to kind of, if you're walking into this hobby, if you're considering crossing the line and starting to collect arcade games, pinball machines, anything coin-op, there's some things that you kind of need to be aware of. So, first off, I want to say, let's decide what your path is going to be. Because you will discover, as a new collector, it will get out of hand quickly. There's always a deal. You're always someplace where there's another game, there's another piece. I don't collect that, but it's sitting there, and that person wants it gone. And it is, um, is it the old Doritos, you know, you can't just have, or is that Oreo cookies? You can't. Lay's potato, potato chips. I have no reference here for advertising at all, and they're not paid. But that's kind of what can happen, all right? So, you know, what can you collect? What are we going to kind of cover? Arcade games, pinball machines, and I'm going to throw redemption games in here. I am uh, a child of the 80s, so my game is going to be a Pac-Man, a Galaga, a Galaxian, that genre of video games. Pinball machines, mm, they were kind of out of the arcade by the time I was in the arcade. But I have a like for them. I like the later, the earlier D&D up to the modern games, dot matrix display games, and the early alphanumeric games. Some of the older solid state games. I, I've developed a fondness for them. But I, I realize that there's a lot of people now that are looking at redemption games because that was their arcade game. That's what they played, whether it was at Chuck E. Cheese's, Wherever there was a redemption table and they got the spider ring for 87 tickets that cost their mom $42, that was their thing. And people collect those. And then there's this oddball, other coin off. And we'll talk about that. Because as you start collecting, that stuff makes its way into your game room at times. All right. So some things to consider. Space. We're going to touch on each of these. Budget. Maintenance. And then if you're going to maintain your own games, uh, parts and specialty tools. So, you know, I, I've kind of got a little representation, pinball, arcade. Uh, that's a, a media tumbler. If you get into pinball and then you start tearing pinball machines apart and you're doing your own maintenance, that's kind of a specialty, a specialty tool you might want to consider. In the old venerable soldering iron, if you're going to get out and you're going to start trying to work on your games and maintain your own equipment, that's a consideration. So we'll talk, uh, we'll talk about each of these points. So first off, space, all right? And this is, people ask me about games all the time. And I say, what you've got to realize is when you see this equipment out and you see it in a venue, it looks different than it does in your home. In your home, in a smaller space, you, you realize that Pac-Man is darn near the size of a literal refrigerator. Everybody comes up to uh, an arcade collector and they say, I remember being at this pizza place or that place, and they had a set down Galaxian or Galaga or Pac-Man. You know, I don't know, in this area, I'm from Kentucky, we had Pizza Huts. And uh, I don't know if that was a common thing here in Tennessee, but every Pizza Hut had a Pac-Man cocktail. Arcade collectors don't like Pac-Man or any of the cocktail cabinets because it takes up the space of three games. The cabinet itself, a little wider than a regular arcade game, 
And then if you think about two chairs either side of it, that's three cabinets. That's three games for one game. Something to consider, okay? So if you, if you think about a pinball machine, now it's a refrigerator in, a, in yet an additional dimension. That's, two, that's the space of two refrigerators back to back when you think about how it protrudes off of your wall, all right? So my game room, this is a picture of a portion of my game room, and I have to be very careful where I place pinball machines because it will obstruct the entire room. And again, if you see a, a, a machine in a venue, you see a machine on location, large space, it might look like a lot. Trust me, it is. So you need to consider this stuff. Talking about kind of getting out of hand, take a look at this picture on the right. So believe it or not, there's a car in that picture. Yes, there is a car in that picture. And it is completely enclosed and encased and entombed in arcade games. And this is an example of how things can kind of get out of hand. Hey, I've got a deal. Well, okay, well, I'll put it on the truck. All right, well, I'll take it with you. Okay, it was $50. Okay, it was $200. You can easily kind of dominate the space that you've got if you start to get into this hobby. And like a lot of us have maybe a little lack of self-control. Because once you jump in, and uh, uh, any collectors in the room will realize this, you'll probably hear a couple laughs. Um, you will, most people buy just about everything they can get their hands on. When they, when, a, when an individual realizes they can own an arcade game, they can own that pinball machine, they can own that Pac-Man, then it's like a bug. And they will just multiply. So just a word to the wise, I'm not discouraging anybody, but just things to think about as you, if you're considering collecting, uh, collecting games. So budget. This is up to the individual, and it's up to the time. So like right now, games are at a pretty all-time high. There's new games being produced, new pinball machines, there's a couple companies making new arcade games in a classic style. And of course, there's new video games that kind of walk that line between a, re a redemption game that has ticket capability, but it's a little bit like a video game that, that we all kind of know and love from back in the day. Terminator Salvation is probably a very good example. There used to be one in every Walmart in the South. And you started to see them kind of come through auctions. Uh, it's an affordable game. It's a large game. It's a new game. This, you know, so you can pay new game prices. If you look at classic games, the very popular games, they'll, they'll demand the money. Pac-Man, they made an untold number of pac Well, I'm sure someone knows how many Pac-Mans were made. Very common game, but it's a very desirable game. So the prices are high. Rarity in this market does not necessarily mean expensive. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. On the pinball side, Adam's Family, highest production pinball game of all time. One of the more expensive pinball games that you can, that you can purchase. It's so popular, it's so desirable that when they come for sale, they go at a, at a good rate. So, point being here, you got to do your homework. Ask people in your area, ask local collectors, uh, coming to an event like this, that's a good place to come to meet people. And then sometimes you can even find things for sale. You, and we'll, we'll touch on that a little later, where you can go to get, you know, the game that maybe you're desiring. So along with the budget, it's not just the cost of the game. Because keep in mind, these, for the most part, unless you're going to go buy brand new games from IT, or ice or somebody like that these are this is used equipment and for the most part a lot of the games at least in the circles that i walk in 20 30 plus years old and uh with age comes issues so that's another thing if there's if you're looking for particular titles particular genres of games 
you really kind of have to understand and research a little bit what your potential downfalls are, either just generally, say with a video game, generally with a pinball machine, or in some cases with the specific title. Because I'll, I'll pick on a, a classic game of my youth, Pole Position. Pole Position brings with it, your I see a couple eyes kind of rolling out here. Pole Position brings with it your typical arcade problems, monitor issues, perhaps control problems. But the board set in pole position is an entire beast on, unto itself. And you just, you, well, can they be made to run? Can they be made to run reliable, reliably? I feel, yes, they can. I don't think that's a problem. I, I have one and I've made several run what I would call very reliably. But they are a unique animal and it takes a bit to get it there. And they're... Uh, they're difficult to work on, so it takes a special skill set to work on them. Again, point being, it's not just the purchase price of the equipment. You've got to think what you're looking at down the road. And I, I gave a little example here. I said hidden costs. And this picture down here on the uh, on Ural's lower left, that is an edge connector from, I'm not sure which game that is off of. That might be a pack. I'd have to go back and look at my original files. But if you bought a working game, and we'll talk a little bit about, again, this in a second, this is something I would consider a hidden cost. The fingers on this edge connector are damaged, and they've been repaired in kind of a not very... Um, the, the, they, the, it, what's, it, there's not a lot, of, a lot of longevity here to this repair. This will end up causing problems down the road. You have to kind of be aware of what you're getting into. The game may look great. The car may look awesome. You know, but that motor might not have ever had the oil changed. Same thing, can, same thing here. You got to do a little research. I really would suggest that you don't rush in. And this all figures into your budget, okay? Uh, kind of like with cars, you do to a certain degree get what you pay for. There are deals, and then there are also unscrupulous people at times. So again, the more homework you can do, the more research you can do, the better educated you are, the, the better you'll be in the hobby. So speaking of maintenance of parts, this is, this is a big question mark that uh, a lot of new collectors have. So again, this is older equipment. And I'll, I'll pick on a, pin, a, a general pinball machine. That's a perfect example. It is, depending on your title, let's just say a 20-year-old box of wood and plastic with an inch and an eighth steel ball hurtling through it at breakneck speeds. Things will break. It is inevitable. The machines, none of these machines were designed to last as long as they are. Even back in the day, speaking with operators, parts we can get today, ramps, plastics, a lot of operators couldn't get that back in the day. The third party companies have picked up production of this stuff. The operators couldn't get it because once they had the machine for a couple of years, Williams, Bally, Gottlieb, they wanted you to buy another machine. They expected it to run its course and it's gone, all right? And then on the arcade side, that's why so many Pac-Mans, Galagas, Galaxians, you name it, Donkey Kong, Nintendo cabinets, stuff that's cherished today was converted. So it got to a point where people no longer dropped quarters in a Pac-Man. And guess what? We're gonna put a JAMA harness in it and we're gonna play some side-scrolling shooter. That was just the way of the world, okay? So if you fast forward now 20, 30 years, there's a lot of this stuff in the aftermarket. You can get parts, there is support, air quotes, out on the internet. There's a wealth of good information and bad information. Again, you know, I really caution you to research. But this is a decision that you have to make. Are you in a position to fix your own game? If so, to what degree, 
or are you going to look for somebody to maintain it? If you want to look for someone to maintain it, you need to start asking in your area. I know in my hometown, I can on one hand and not use all the fingers and discounting my thumb, I can name all the people in my town that will go and work on machines. And uh, again, I'm from, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, largest city in the state of Kentucky. And I know a lot of people that can fix machines. They fix their own machines. I know many of those people, but there are scant few that will take time out of their life to go work on your game. Or that actually, now that I think about it, there's no one left in my hometown that I'm aware of that actually repairs games for a living to, with the public. They've worked, they now work in venues. So this is something to consider. I, I have many, many people come to me and say, hey, can you or do you know someone or can you work on this? And generally the answer is yes, but most of those people, they have full-time jobs. They have families and that's not what they do. So again, I'm not one to discourage anybody. Again, if you listen to our show, the Broken Token Podcast, we do technical segments, trying to, in an audio format, teach people how to do some basic to some advanced repairs that are common across pinball and arcade. But you need to be aware that it's something that you, you need to be able to do yourself unless you've got a resource in your area that you can rely on. Otherwise, you're going to have a wooden refrigerator sitting in a corner that does nothing. So just kind of a word of the wise. Uh, it happens. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about condition. So you're going to go out and you're going to you're going to look for a game. And again, this is where education comes in. You can't ask too many questions. Uh, to a certain degree, advice is free. And if you ask anybody that knows me personally, I invite a lot of people. Hey, walk up to me. If you're interested in something, ask me. And if I know about it, I'll share that with you. And many people in a convention like we're at here in Nashville today, they are the same way. Many collectors are the same way. And I like to think all collectors are that way. We want to share that with everybody. So arm yourself with education. And so I'm giving, a, here's a couple of examples of things that can be hiding that you may not necessarily catch as a, as a new purchaser of a piece of coin-op equipment. We hear this all the time, fully shocked. That's generally applied to a pinball machine. I have had many people ask me, what does that mean? And my answer is, well, it means something different to this person, and it does to this person, and it does to this person, and it does to me. When I fully shop a pinball machine, I strip the play film completely apart. I tumble all the metal. It gets three coats of wax after it's cleaned. Anything that's broken looks broken or even just looks at me funny gets replaced. The other end of the spectrum, and, and there's people that go deeper than that. There's people that will completely touch up any spec on the play field, total re-clear the play field. The other end of the spectrum is, is I'm going to replace the rubbers that I can reach. I'm going to wipe it down where I can reach it and slap a little wax on it. Off she goes. If there's a dead lamp, I'll replace it. So it runs the spectrum. Don't take fully shopped as fully shopped. And what you hear a lot with pinball and arcade is working 100%. Again, you've got to educate yourself. What does that mean? Does, um, does all the switches work in the pinball? What happens when you turn the game on, the arcade game on cold? Does it take 10 minutes for the monitor to come on? You know, I like to look at a game, if it's a game that I'm gonna spend capital money on, I'll ask the person, leave it off till I get there. I wanna see it come on cold. You can turn it on, let it warm up a little bit. The game like the monitor might work its way past some issues that would tell you it's time to service the monitor. Again, educate yourself. So if you look up here, it's a couple, this is an example of a couple things that are like could be hidden in a game. And these are actually from games that I've had that were working 
100%. So up here to the right, this is a kicker for a slingshot on a pinball machine, a Williams game. If memory serves, this came out of the big guns, okay? System 11, is that right? So take a look at the link right here. This is what the link, this is the plunger that goes down into the coil. Coil fires, pulls this down, pulls that, pivots that, kicks the ball. All right, the slingshots, if you're not familiar, are generally those the triangular uh, uh, things, if you will, just above the flippers, right and the left. There's usually a triangular shaped plastic on it. Ball hits it, it'll kick it back up into play, up into the play field generally. Um, triangular mechanism is probably a better term there than things. So this one was from the other side of the game, and that is a link off of a flipper. Wrong size, wrong length, a lot of space, wrong hole size here. So this was probably a field fix. Somewhere in the life of the game, it was broken. Operator, technician came out. We'll get it making money again. We'll let the slingshot fire. All I've got is a flipper plunger. Stick it in there. Does it work? Yeah. Is it trivial? To a certain degree, yes. Is it wrong? Yes. For the game. Simple example of what you will find through a game. Okay? And then down here, this is another example of an edge connector uh, from a video game. And I, it's different than the earlier picture. I'd have to go back and take a peek at the bigger file to see what that's off of. But again, this is something that could be hiding in the game. And what we've got here is the fingers. This is totally repairable, but it's not going to last. You will have a problem with this sooner than later. This is something hiding in a game here. Now, the telltale sign here, if you look down the, uh, to your right, that's speaker wire is, is commonly randomly soldered to an arcade PCB. So what had happened here is there's several games out there. Pac-Man will do it. This Pac-Man will do it. Centipede. Whole position. Handful of games. Again, ask around. People that work on the games have the games, have this knowledge. They'll pull a lot of current. And over all of these years, these years that the game is expected to have been at a landfill, you'll get a lot of heat where they're pulling current on power pins for a handful of several games. I just listed a few. A lot of these hard games do it. Dick Doug will do it. And it'll just burn the fingers right off the edge connector. Totally repairable if you've got the skill or you've got someone that can help you that has the skill. Not a big deal, just something to kind of be aware of. And again, condition is king. So if you open up a game, this things like this are easy to miss. But if you open up a pinball machine and you've done a little education and you're like, why is the wire just looped hanging under the play field? Seen it all, seen it a ton of times. Somebody can't figure out where there's a break, They'll just jumper it, and then you'll have a long loop of wire hanging out of the harness. If it doesn't look right, chances are it's not. A, a lot of times when people are in a rush, they won't put things back in the factory harness. The wire will look new versus old. Things will stand out. Point here being, don't get so excited about potentially owning this that you lose uh, you lose focus on what's in the box, what's in this big wooden refrigerator that plays Pac-Man that might be a little problematic for me down the road. Now, is this discouragement not to buy a game? No. If you can adjust maybe the price, if you could repair it yourself, if you could work it out with the seller, that's decisions I've made. I have, I have, I ended up setting a driving limit for me to purchase games because that limit was how far did I want to go on a round trip and come back into camp. And I've done it. I've pushed the edge of that limit, looked at the game and said, I'll pass and move, move right on. All right, so some specific consideration here. That was kind of generic. Some specific consideration here for video games. Um, you know, plug it in and just straight up try to assess any issues. Play the game. If it's a multi 
Play your game, multiple joysticks, multiple sets of controls. Play all the controls. All right. Generally, if it's like a four-player game or a two-player game, number one is they're blown out because that's where all the play happens. Number two, generally okay. But it can happen, and I've seen this many a times, if you get a four-player game, say a Simpsons or whatever, people maybe in a home setting don't play three or four. Those, you could have a wiring problem. Someone could have got in it, dropped the ground off of it. These don't work. If you're familiar with the game, it might be an easy fix. Joysticks and buttons are actually pretty inexpensive. Something just to consider. Don't get caught up in the game of owning it and not look at what's there. All right, so a couple quick things. Uh, is the game playing blind? What does that mean? Turn the game on. You can hit the credit. You hear it credit up. Hit player one start. Ataris are really nice, the classic ones, because they have, they have flashing uh, player one, player two buttons. Can you hear the game running? Nothing on the screen. All right, that's classic air quotes playing blind. Monitor time. It's a unique skill set. A lot of people are afraid of monitors because it's a high voltage piece of equipment. Do I dissuade people from working on monitors? No. Do your homework. I'm not responsible. I'll throw that in there right now. Okay. And, oh, and by the way, any time during this, um, I, if you might say a question, stop it. Because I know I'm just rambling on and on and on. If you all have got questions, um, please just, just pay. Okay, here we go. Well, like one of them's up there, water damage. Is it like cars? Are there certain parts of the country that are more susceptible to rust, rot, any kind of condensation damage? Whereas other parts of the country, the machines are naturally more well -deserved. That is a very good question. As a car guy at heart, and I will freely admit, that picture with the car in the garage, that's my garage. <laughs> so, I, as a car guy at heart, that's a really, really good question. So the question was, um, let me jump down to that. Is it, uh, I'll, I'll knock this out real quick. So, monitor issues, is it running, but it doesn't look right? Are the colors washed out? Do you see a, a like a ripple wash across it? Do you see brighter colors on one side and they get lighter across the monitor? The monitor's working, you're already about 80% there. Those issues are resolvable with, with a monitor rebuild. That everyone calls it recapping. You're going through and you're replacing all the electrolytic capacitors. Can a, a, can a novice do that? Absolutely, I think they could do that. Is it something that you as an individual buying game might be prepared to do with your first game? That's what you have to consider. All right. Again, it works to your advantage to partner with somebody in the area that might have a couple of those specialty tools. Might you willing to sit down and pull a couple caps out and show you how to, how to do it and then hand you the tools and let you do it. Things to be aware of. Just because it's working doesn't mean it works. Car of a nice running Chevrolet 350, if you pull a cylinder out of it, it'll run. It might run fairly well, it might get you home, but it's not right. So, uh, and totally dead. That just, what do I do? Is it power? Uh, is the board bad? I mean, you're, there's a whole, that's a whole conversation into itself. And again, that might be one of those. I appreciate the time. I'm going to have to walk away from this one. You have to make that decision. Now, uh, cosmetic art and then the water damage. I'm going to go a little different direction, but I'm going to answer your questions to, to the best of my knowledge. So cosmetics and cab, that's important to a lot of people. My co-host on the show who happens to be sitting in the room, raise your hand, Whitney. Whitney, he is a, a very, he, he likes... To be honest, very clean games. I'm a it, I'm a he's a he's a stickler for for the ball to a fault for a clean cabinet and good art. I, on the other hand, I don't mind a little patina. Now, have I replaced control panels or uh, overlays? Absolutely. Uh, will I replace buttons and joysticks? Absolutely. Have I ever side arted a cab? No. Has Whitney? Yes. And that's fine because that's the direction Whitney takes. And that's, that's what fits in his collection and how he wants to, to uh, 
curate it? Have I bought a better example of a game and sold the one I have? Absolutely, I have. <laughs> I've traded up. Four times over. Yeah, sometimes four times over, exactly. So things to look for is if you want the good art, and this game doesn't have it, but the cab saw it, is it reproduced? Or is, does this game have good, good art on it? Another thing to kind of pay attention, and I'm getting to the water thing here. Another thing to really pay attention to is the bottoms of cabinets. Give you an idea of the history of that cabinet. Talked about cars. Well, this car looks great. You crawl up underneath it. This car came from up north because there's a lot of rust and there's a lot of issues because they saw the roads up north. We get some of that in Kentucky and I would assume Tennessee. And then as you get down further south, you don't have that issue. There's a gentleman here. I know he's, he's down from uh, in Miami, over there. In where? Atlanta. Atlanta. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were. Atlanta. Okay, yeah. So you're in Atlanta now, but you didn't have that. You don't have that problem down south. What you'll see on a lot of cabs and the water damage where I was going to go with it is Atari's is a perfect example. This is particle board. What happens in a, in a bar, hopefully, at least once a week, they're going to mop the floors. And that particle board is like a sponge. I have had seen, I don't know how many beautiful pole positions down to this point. I don't know how many beautiful centipedes, beautiful, down to that point. Because as they mop the venue, and they push a mop bucket up against it, or a mop up against it, it rips it up. Now, kind of to your point, there are games, and this is, again, I'll pick on Cubert from Gotland and reactors in the same cabinet. That whole cabinet is a sponge. And it is very uncommon to find a Qbert that doesn't have little clock marks all over the side of the cabinet. And if it's come from a, a location or it's uh, uh, either geographically up north where it might rain a little bit more um, or if it was at a campsite or next to a pool at a hotel, in a very humid climate, you'll know it because you'll it'll it'll be worse than maybe the next one. Something to look out for. Another thing, uh, you know, get along the bottom here. Um, speaking of the cabinet, a lot of people honestly they look at what goes on from the control panel and the monitor. Check out, make sure you check out the box. I'll pick on Century Cabinets, Phoenix, one of my favorite games. Pine Pollock, one of my more favorite games. Those cabinets, we were talking about it here with a gentleman in the room earlier, because we've got there's one out here on the floor now. There's a little overhang right here in the front in the kick panel where the kick panel is recessed behind the edge. This is this is a battle zone, of course. You've got to step on it. Um, normal arcade cabinet's not going to have the step. The, this would be the kick panel space. As you're standing in front of it, that's where your toes are up against. Some cabinets, Centuri is a good example, the side right here protrudes past the kick panel. The kick panel is recessed a couple inches, and it's part of the board. So you mop in front of it for 10 years, and then you got an inch and a half of part of the board sticking out, 50%, 80%, how, depending on where, you know, I've, I've seen... So let's say 70% of them that I've seen, they're kicked out. Can you live with it? So like I said, again, I'm not discouraging anybody, but I'd hate for someone to get something home and it's not as shiny of a diamond as you thought that it was. Now, another thing in terms of uh, locale, and I know I've seen this, I'm sure, Berto, you've probably seen it, a couple of the other collectors in the room, the metal work. So uh, you don't have a lot that you can see per se on this battle zone, but you've got a piece of metal right here that holds the, uh, the front that faux periscope on. There's a piece of metal along the top, and of course the control panel here is all metal. Coin door's metal. Coin door will get a lot of touch. So that'll give you an idea where the game come from. That'll get that's a high wear spot. And if it came from uh, a humid climate, you'll see this maybe roughly spray painted, 
maybe still has rust on it, that's a good telltale. Same thing with pinball machines. Many a pinball machine I've opened up and you can see a little scale on every piece of metal. You know, the inside of a pinball machine wasn't designed to be exposed to the elements, but there's a ton of machines that are out there that are 30, 40 years old, and uh, none of the mechanisms are rusted. But there's a ton of them where you open that play field up and you look in there, or you look in the back of a video game, and you look at the frame that the monitor's held together with, and it's kind of... Uh, got like a white powder on it, and where it's starting to kind of oxidize. So that'll give you an indication too. And generally, especially on a pinball, when you start seeing that, you see it on the surface, you know it's in every nook and cranny. So it's something to consider. All right, so speaking of consideration in pin games, so the first thing I do is I'll plug it in. You know, if everyone goes through this, um, what do you do when you first see a game? I'm not afraid of it. At some point in time, it was plugged in before it wasn't. And at some point in time, it's going to be plugged in again. I don't care if it's going to blow a fuse. I don't care if it's going to pop a coil. I don't care. I'll give it a once over to make sure I don't see anything there. I plug the game in. That's the way I roll. You want to check it out, especially if it's a shocked working game. So electronics, glass off. I want to test all the coils. I want to start a game. General, good general advice here. I want to start a game and I want to play it by hand. I want to roll a ball over everything. I'm not necessarily maybe worried about every switch, but if someone is selling this game for a premium price and they say it works all the way, every switch really kind of needs to work. You don't want to start testing with your fingers. One, a coil could fire and get your finger. Had many hit me, never had an injury, your mileage may vary, but it's it's alarming, all right? The, the ball, however, is what you want to use to actuate everything. Even when you're tuning a game, a little advice there, you the ball, you want to tune it for the ball, not your finger reaching in there and tripping all the switches. But um, are you willing to strip a game apart? Are you willing to replace broken parts? How about maybe just clean and wax it? If you buy a beautiful restored game or even a brand new in the box game, eventually you're going to have to at least wipe the dust out of it and wax it. I have gone and bought many a machine and the owner didn't even know how to take the glass out of it. And it sat like that in a corner, taking up the space of two refrigerators for a decade. So it might have been a good deal, but something to really kind of consider. And, you know, as an example here, if you look down here in the lower left, that is roughly everything that come out of a getaway, the Williams getaway, minus the hardware. So that's all the ramps, most of the plastics, uh, all the metal work. Everything that took the play field down to just the flat play field. That's quite a bit of stuff. And I always like it in a kind of a car, back to the car thing. Anytime I see somebody that can rebuild a an automatic transmission, automatic transmission is good size, but when everything pukes out of it, it's like, how did all that fit in there? Well, that's what you can kind of get into the play field. Am I discouraging you? No. I've had many opportunity to buy many a game that got to this point and was put in a box. Okay, so again, you have to make some decisions and consider, is this something that I want to do or am I going to be able to find somebody that I can pay to do this? All right, sir. Now, earlier you talked about touch of the playing field mm -hmm. on a pinball machine. What's the general consensus of touching up the game model? modification. Is it is it a personal preference or is it frowned upon? Is it encouraged? So and um I take it you're kind of a car person maybe or are you are you okay? Not all but it's a good analogy. Okay and we, honestly in one of our early shows we were talking about it and this is where my mind goes with this. In the car world what is considered original because stuff is reproduced. And if you want to be super nefarious about it Say you want to build a GTO, 
GTO is based on the Le Mans. You've got a destroyed GTO, but you've got a bin tag that says vehicle identification number. This is a GTO. I want to pick it up. We'll put it on this Le Mans. Well, guess what? I've got a GTO right now that's not crumpled in a corner. Now I can restore this as a GTO. So what I'm thinking along your lines is this, am I? And, and then there's a whole school of thought is original versus restored. Generally, as I see it in the pinball community, there's not much of, honestly, much of a discussion. There's appreciation for an original machine. And there are the people that like them basically as art. And they like to be able to say, which is fine, this is an original X. This is an original Y. And it just sits there. It's pretty. But on mass, pinball people and kind of arcade people, they, they, want it, they want it functional. They want to play it. And they are perfectly fine with, I'm going to make it run, even though maybe the play field's kind of blown out, or I'm going to restore this thing better than that. Gottlieb never made a game this good. Williams never made a game this good. There's a couple of machines out here on the floor right now for free play that are way past factory. They never made a machine as nice as this machine was restored. And that's, that's accepted. So that's generally the, the consensus. They're like, actually, case in point, this is uh, my Adams family right here. And I threw that in there as an example of what you can kind of quickly get into if you get a little carried away. And oh, I'm going to clean it. I'll take this off. I'm going to do this. But actually, I've got a presentation on, on shopping a game and touch up. I've got a big section on touch up in it as well. So um, maybe I can share that with you or I can talk with Dave and we can see about running it this weekend. But um, I had to touch up the play field on this. And to me, that made that made the game that much better. With paint. With paint, yes. Paint, and then I had to clear those areas to seal it in. Absolutely. The uh, Adams, and this goes back to educate yourself. Call back here. Adams is very bad. This is the mansion. Shows your progression through the game. And it's a lot of inserts really close together in a high travel area right above the flippers. And it's common about the paint just blowing off of it. A lot of ball travel. I basically had to recreate all the windows or touch up at least every window frame in this game. And then I had some issues up here at the slingshot and then back here at the at the uh, ball behind the behind the bookcase. And you know, like I said, that's in, in the pinball community as a whole, that's Hey, you're making that game. You're putting it back in service. Again, something to consider. What, how much do you want to get into? All right, so let's move on here. So look, real quick, I want to touch on other point op stuff. All the above and more. And there's so, there's so I mean, that, that's a whole other series of presentations because there's so much potential point op stuff. Now we're starting to get into maybe other pieces in the game room. I've got a, a, a capsule vendor in my game room that's got a clown in it. And it is, it is unique. It's a clown puppet on a swing with a very maniacal face. And honestly, I should have put the picture of it in, in the presentation. Um, point being, though, some people collect that specific thing. I want to collect a capsule vendor. Or uh, when I was growing up, and now I've got some disposable income, the arcades I went to, they, they had these kind of game-like vendors, or they vended candy, or you did something to get tickets for the redemption thing. Again, there are a million variations of one of the more popular ones, where I, honestly, I probably should have thrown this in here. Uh, it, there's a um, Bromley Rocket, I think it's called Rock and Bowl. And in my mind, it's one of the more popular 
roll down like Target games. I don't even know what the official name is for it, but it was a ticket vendor. And it had, I know there's Simpsons themed one, there's a blue million themes of them, but you've got a play field that kind of rotates or moves down in the game. You look down in the game, imagine a pinball field factor, but smaller, and you've got a shoot where you drop a token. And the shoot on the token might wave back and forth. The intention is to hit a target, to score more, to get tickets. There's people out there, that was their arcade game, and they're collecting those games. Point, now, here's the point. You gotta get parts for those. Stuff like that is kind of in that middle ground where they made however many. They were a hot ticket for six months, 12 months, 18 months. They changed the art, maybe improved it a little bit, a little different here so that it brought the kids back to it. It's gone. Got to consider that. The market for those isn't like this for pinball and arcades when you've got third party support. It's all mechanical in a lot of cases. So, um, this here to the right, this is a cartoon theater. In my neck of the woods, every Kmart had one of these in the front. And these are, these are really, really kind of fun. And there's, this is a niche thing that collectors will collect. These actually had film projectors in them that were for salesmen. Salesmen would come to you. I think it was uh, maybe an eight. Could have been a 16 millimeter cartridge. You want to see, I want to sell you a vacation. I'll throw the suitcase down, open it up, screens in the top, plug in the cart. I'm selling you the cruise. A lot of car dealerships had it. You want to see what the new Vega looks like? And it plays on loop over in the corner. Well, these theaters were based on those. And there's a, there's, this was a common design in my area. But that company also made a few other variations. You can get the projectors. You're not going to get the movies because the movies were made to order. You get a sheet with this and uh, you check it off. You call the company, you mail it in. They would make you the movies on that format to order that worked in this type of equipment. So if that's something that's near and dear to you, you've got to realize it's one thing to own it, it's another thing to have it run and to maintain it. A little bit more difficult than a standard pinball or arcade. And again, a lot of, a lot of arcade collectors, they will branch out into these things and some will specialize, some will branch out and they'll be added into the game room. All right, so finally here, acquiring the prize. How do you do it? Facebook's kind of where it's at right now. And for better or for worse, like Facebook or hate Facebook, the Facebook Marketplace and the groups. So there's a blue million arcade pinball. Uh, there's change machine support and sales groups. If you could imagine, if you can dream it, Pretty much, there's a Facebook group, Facebook group for it. That's the place to go to buy and sell today, honestly. Um, Craigslist is out there. It still kind of hangs on. But it's so easy for somebody to have Facebook on the phone, take a picture of it, list it, whether it's just someone that has it in the garage or a collector. Someone that has it in the garage will typically find it in the marketplace. A collector, you'll typically find it in the specialty groups. All right, that's kind of the go-to. Like I said, Craigslist, like I said, still hangs on. A few things get posted there. Honestly, it's still not a bad idea to look there because you might be able to kind of scoop something. Unfortunately, Facebook's where it's at. It can be kind of cutthroat. So again, my caution here is: don't be so excited to own something that you just jump right in. And no, I want that pot man. And I know you've got somebody, but I'll give you an extra hundred dollars if you hold it for me. More times than not, you end up kind of in the rears. So um, personally, I don't like to hunt for games. Generally, I kind of just keep an eye out and I don't get too excited. And I've been very fortunate in being very reserved and, and not being basically bunked. So again, don't be excited, don't be overexcited. And then finally, auctions. So these pictures here are actually from an auction. So um, 
These are from Sevierville, Tennessee. So if you're a local in the state, uh, Sevierville will have, there'll be an auction there, I guess, and I guess like a fairground type, type area, usually every six months. And these are pictures from an auction uh, a couple years ago, just, a, just an example. You can get arcade games, pinball machines, modern arcade games. There's a Terminator Salvation. There's a, uh, a DDR, that's a little older unit. Here's some arcade games that were there. There's this particular auction. There's classics. If you look right over here, there's a Defender. I think that's a Stargate. There's a Galaxian. And uh, that's, uh, I can't make it out, a Robocop there. And everything else. Gumball machines, redemption games, roll down games, ski balls, punching bags. All of it can be found at these auctions. Now, quick note on this. This is a buyer beware type situation. You really have to do your homework when you get into these. It's not uncommon, and I'll say it right here, it is not uncommon for the owner of the item to show up at the auction and build, bid their item up. They've made a decision what they want for that, and they will bid their item up. Generally, if you go into these auctions, it's a good idea to ask the terms for a seller because a seller might be able to just do a straight up buyback and it might cost him $10 or her $10, which means I'm going to bring this out. I'm going to take a risk on it. I want X amount of money for it. I might have my associate bid it up, but if I can't get enough action to get it to my price, I'll buy it, air quotes, from myself but I'll pay the auction company the buyback price. It might cost them $5 to try to sell it. So just something to kind of keep in mind. Kind of like, I mean, that happens on eBay too. It's harder to do now, but it happens where an unscrupulous seller might have an unscrupulous friend or they just may have a secondary account they bought a few things on and they bid their own items up. Same thing happens in real life. If you haven't been to an auction, I'll touch that on that real quick. Generally, how every auction I've been to, regardless of the auction house runs, is um, as you'll have a preview period, you can come in. Generally, you can plug the games in. You have to bring your own extension cord. You can take a, you can try it out. When the auction runs, they will have a runner plug everything in as they go. So it's a rolling power situation that might be a 10 game, eight game window that moves with the auctioneer. And if the game comes up, he'll say working all the way and then they'll start bidding. So you have to realize that to him, that's working all the way. That doesn't mean that the game works. That doesn't mean that the pin works. That doesn't mean that the joysticks work. He says, work it all the way. He's not liable. Don't get too excited. Don't get caught in a frenzy. Don't bid in the middle of the night on eBay. Um, if you're considering going to an auction, my biggest suggestion is go to one or two first by that auction house and don't plan to buy anything. Just see how it runs. The severe auctions are big enough where they'll run two auctioneers. They'll run an auctioneer down. They'll do all the classics. First, <coughs> pardon me. Then they'll run someone down all the videos, and then they'll have somebody right behind them, and they'll start running the redemption. And if you want video, you go here. If you want redemption, you go here. They'll run pinballs last. That's the way they do it. Other auction houses, it's one auctioneer, and they do the whole thing. Always pinballs will be last because they want people will be there for the pinballs, and they'll hold them as long as they can, trying to get them to buy other games. But I strongly suggest, if you're looking at an auction, it's a good place to see a lot of games. It's a good place to see many things in one place and have an opportunity to buy a lot of equipment. But you need to understand what you're getting into. You need to understand what the buyer's fees are. You need to understand what the seller's games are. And you need to understand how that particular auction company runs. So again, I would suggest that you go to at least an auction and maybe partner up with somebody locally that has been there and they can be your guide at that, that auction. So, 
Um, and then past that, here's all of our contact information. So I, again, I'm Brent with uh, Broken Token. I'm Brent Broken Token, and my co-host down here is, I know it's been a long day, Whitney. Whitney, uh, all, anything that you didn't like about the presentation, please email to Whitney at brokentoken.com. And uh, we are just about on every podcast app that you can find. We actually just kicked out our 101st episode, which is probably technically, I think we've probably got actually 105, 106 episodes. We've been at this how long, Whitney? How many years at this uh, point? Right, right at eight years. So um, again, our show, we get a little insight into Whitney and I, uh, my collecting life and kind of what goes on and what we uh, kind of where our game rooms are looking like, and uh, we touch on technical segments. We have interview segments. We like to interview collectors all the way up to industry individuals. Uh, we've had Billy Mitchell on the show several times. We've had pinball designers and artists on the show, and we've had people just like us that collect, and we get their stories to how they got into the hobby. Uh, Whitney is, uh, again, because he's heavy into the art and he's heavy into restorations, Whitney brings that to the table for the show. We discuss things that are coming available, things that are available, and we also, we're really uh, moving into some console, classic console stuff. It's always been peppered through there, Atari, Vectrex, little Commodore stuff. Uh, and we're, we're getting a little bit more because that's a, that's a very exciting field. The gentleman that was here before me was talking about Atari homebrews. So we, we kind of cater to everybody. We're a very personal show. We were very, uh, we keep a, a clean rating. So it's a fam. We wanted a family oriented show. And if you, we'd appreciate it. You know, if you check us out at any of your podcast, uh, uh, uh distributors of choice and give us a listen. And with that, I mean, is there any other questions? Yes, sir. We say how everything fluctuates price plus. Yes. Is there anything that's dropped down recently or escalated recently? Has COVID affected anything? Okay, so the question, so that, because we're recording, so that in, um, uh, people that maybe hear this later can hear the question is, is uh, price fluctuations, has anything dropped down or maybe uh, escalated and has COVID affected everything? Generally, across the board, right now, in uh, what month is this? It's been so uh, October of 2021. Across the board, everything's up. Everything. All pinballs. Pinballs have been on an increase for a while. Arcades have been on an increase for a while. But generally, across the board, right now, everything's pretty high. It's just the hobby is catching fire. The, he the hobby's catching fire. You're seeing. Um, before COVID, I happened to notice that JAMA games were getting very pricey because honestly, a lot of this hobby travels with the age group that's got the money. Okay, so 20 or 30 years ago, later EM games, early solid state pinball games, they were, that's where it was at. Kind of tailored off, dropped off a little bit. Then your solid state, uh, newer solid state games, alphanumeric games, the games with dot matrix displays, they started picking up. Your Pac Man's on the arcade side, they've always been kind of high, um, at least in my career. And I've, I've, I keep joking until I finally hit the number, I guess. I've been, I've said forever I've done this for about 15 years, but then we realized how long we've done the show. So it's probably pushing closer to 20 that I've collected. Uh, so I've started seeing games that were $100 games, Street Fighters, some of the variants of Street Fighters. Those, the boards alone are four, $500. Capcom games are super hot. And right now, I don't know if it's people being at home, having a little extra money because it's not being spent in other places, but prices are escalating quite a bit. In all fairness. Uh, what's been your experience with any of the new uh, emulation style or things like uh, I was talking about like the Mister? I have heard of the Mister, yes. And uh, some of those things where using names, I guess, uh, turn 
machines and again more capable machines or recreating that as mm-hmm. this way. So the question is is my opinion and experience with emulation through like a mister or main or uh, I mean I'll expand that out to even like the I think it's like the Blue Elf and the, that series of like 301 games or uh, a pie, Raspberry Pi with pie play. Uh, so, my ex- so real quick for anyone that doesn't know what a mister is, it, I think I've got this right. Uh, a mister will, you can load cores for various hardware platforms into a mister. You can make it a Commodore 64. You can make it play arcade games. You can make it an Atari 800 home computer. You load the core into it, and then it becomes that machine. All right, I know I'm a kind of a Commodore guy. That's that's my home computer of choice, what I grew up with. So that's my knowledge of the Mister in the Commodore community, people using it for Commodore emulation. So overall, my opinion is, and I've seen this happen, if you've got a, an arcade game, an original arcade game, original Galaxy, original Pac-Man, don't, don't emulate it. That knowledge is out there. The working boards are out there. Fix the game. I'm not going to take, go back to the GTO analogy, I'm not going to take a very nice 1965 GTO and decide I'm going to make a drag race car out of it. Tub it out, put a blower, you know, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do that. If the cabinet, if you've got a cabinet that was a generic cabinet, or the game was converted out 14 times back in the day and, and did ran its life. Do you restore it? Is it too far gone to do that? I'm not so tied up personally about making that a, a multi-game of some type, whether it's a Mister or Mame with a PC. Where I find the benefit from a Mame or a Pi or a Raspberry Pi and Pi Play that run Mame and run arcade games. Say I want to play a game and I don't have it, but I've got the ROMs, or I can get the ROMs uh, uh, legally. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know where to get the ROMs. I don't suggest where you go get the ROMs, but the ROMs for most games are out there. Okay, just just it's the way the world. It's out there on the internet. I find it very useful if you can take a Raspberry Pi, this is HDMI into this, I can plug it right into a modern television. If I want to sit down and I want to play a game that I don't want to dedicate space, again, the size of a refrigerator, in my game room or my house, I can play it on that Raspberry Pi with a joypad or a joystick I can plug right into it USB. That's where I see the benefit in it, personally. I have had multi-games, have. They've made their way out of my arcade and I brought in dedicated games in their space. But that's me. A lot of people, that makes a lot of sense because I want to play 30, 40, 50 games, but I only have this space. I've got an apartment. That makes sense. I tell you what's kind of the gateway drug is um, the arcade one ups that have been popular the past couple of years. Uh, they're a little spendy, and if for people that aren't familiar with those, they're about what maybe a third the size of a classic cabinet. So they if they would stand about this tall, and then you can get a like a podium that brings them up a little taller. And they're all emulated. If you open up one of those, it's all on the back of that LCD. There's really nothing at the bottom of them. They come flat packed. So that that's kind of a gateway. A lot of people will get those. And that'll be a quick entry, and they'll make a decision, and then they'll make a leap, or they won't, to real hard. So, with that, unless there's any other questions, I appreciate it. You all have a wonderful night. Thank you.